when we look at the art of the Muromachi and Momoyama period, we see alongside the Zen Buddhist art, this samurai aesthetic, where you have this amazing blending of a culture of tremendous violence <laughs> with exquisite refinement, this mixture of militarism and beauty. One anecdote the textbook offers is this one, a ruthless warrior, Nobunaga went so far as to destroy a Buddhist monastery because the monks refused to join his forces. And so this atmosphere of civil war and military opportunism leads to castles that are fortresses against what the textbook explains are the new muskets and cannons that have been imported from Europe and they're changing warfare. But this is also an incredibly beautiful building. A building that's designed in its confusing layout where you feel lost in a maze to thwart invasion and yet it's perched against the sky up on a hill which pro provides an excellent 360 view of possible invasions, excellent, you know, fortress, citadel, sight lines, but also expresses the beauty of the white heron, that is its name. So the textbook shows you the kind of beautiful interior spaces of the samurai court culture and the painting. So showing you the Kano school of painting established by Kano Aitoku that will continue for generations, which is the favorite style for the samurai lords because it, it definitely expresses power and privilege with its sumptuous gold field, its elegance. It reminds us of the bird and flower paintings of Chinese court culture. It's very similar, but there is a kind of strength in the bold lines of the leaves of the marks that create the sense of the tree that I'm calling a sense of power as well as grace. So we really feel a kind of muscular energy in this painting along with the beautiful delicacy. That's the strange paradox of samurai culture. And the vast majority, with some exceptions, of the art we've seen in this class has been made for the ruling class. Right? It has been what we call in art history high art, art of the upper classes, of the most privileged classes. And that is an interesting thing to remember as we turn now to the next period, the Edo period. So the Edo period is named after the capital, today we know it as Tokyo, of the Tokugawa shogun clan that reestablished a period of long-term peace and stability after, you know, the struggles among various samurai clans for control. So they do keep tremendous stability in the society, but they do so through a very controlled hierarchical social system. And I want to explain that a little bit. I mean, there are a number of things. One is that foreigners were outlawed in Japan at this time, except for the Dutch who were allowed to trade. So they, they create a closed society. And along with it being a closed society to outsiders, they create a rigid class structure. And they are using Confucianism to reinforce this class structure. So the ruling class is turning away from Buddhism. It's not serving their political ends. But the people remain predominantly Buddhist. So let me talk about this class structure. And by the way, a change of class was forbidden by law. So the structure of society has the samurai on the top, the cultured elites. So they understand themselves to be the rulers, the warriors, and those who possess the most refined and praiseworthy culture of Japan, the, the great heritage of Japan. Below them are the peasants. That's a word we think of today. We think it's kind of an insulting word that a peasant is the, you know, a lowly, person who scrapes by in the fields. But peasant doesn't necessarily mean um, a very impoverished 
agricultural worker. It comes from the French word paysan, the country. It means an agriculture, a farmer. And there are farmers who are prosperous farmers. They are a very important class. They're the second class below the samurai because they produce the food, the essential elements of the economy, what we eat. Below them are the artisans who work with their hands and for most cultures before the modern era, working with your hands was something to be looked down on. It meant you were low status and low paid. But the lowest of the low, <laughs> interestingly, were those people called chonin, the city people. So they're the merchants. They're the business people. They, they've got the, the city life is how they're making their money. So the interesting thing is that in the, in the Confucian system, as it is articulated by the Tokugawa shoguns, they are low because the, they don't, in Confucian thought, they don't make a significant contribution. They're just handling the fruits of other people's labors. They're just traders. They're not producing. So here's the interesting and unusual twist that gives us a shift in art in this period. The people at the bottom of the hierarchy, the chonin, actually start to amass a lot of wealth because urbanization and commercialization are the two of the three parts of modernization that create surplus. So they're getting, they're, they're, they're low status, but have money. Meanwhile, many samurai are hurting economically. They get paid in rice. They don't get paid in money. They get paid in rice. And the rice crop is unstable. So the city people are growing a rich and developing modern culture of consumer entertainment. And we're going to see that this will be a distinction between the high and the low arts. Magnificent painting will continue to be the domain of the samurai, but we will see cheap prints throw away imagery that is actually incredible and <laughs> much loved and prized today. That is will be the art of the chonin.